You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. As soon as we formed, Colonel Walker ordered us forward and all went well. Our line was perfect as we moved through a piece of woods. We struck a high fence which we got over, forming as we did so, and again we moved up the side of a hill through a wheat field on our left, resting on a fence line leading to a barn. As we rose to the top of this hill, we came face to face with more of the enemy than I had ever seen in one position, and with several pieces of artillery, which opened on us with grape, canister, and small arms, which were mowing the wheat about us like a hailstorm. Immediately in our front was a very strong post fence, which could not be torn down. We could not go forward and would not fall back, so our only alternative was to stand and take it, and most nobly did the regiment do it. But most humbly do I now confess, nothing but pride and a sense of duty kept me from running. Fortunately, the enemy's infantry was not expecting us from that direction, as this was on their flank. Besides, they thinking our force larger, fell back. One of my company, McCopower, was badly wounded and fell almost on me, begging me to take him off the field, but there was no time for favors then. I have seen six men carrying one wounded man from the field, often four and always two. This in itself would render an army almost useless. The best way to protect our wounded friends was to do our duty in the line and drive the enemy from them. Sergeant Samuel D. Buck, 13th Virginia, Elsie's Brigade. I brought up my regiments and opened a tremendous fire into the woods, but a deadly fire came out of it, and my boys were dropped by it rapidly. My noble horse, Jasper, received two shots in quick succession, the first across the hind leg, the second in the left breast, which ranged across and lodged in his right shoulder and totally disabled him. He reared and plunged and nearly fell with me. I sprung off and saw the blood spurting out of his breast and gave him up for dead. I ordered my regiments to push on and turn more to the right in order to turn the left flank of the rebels. They did so, and the 25th Ohio, which was leading, got half into the forest when one of General Fremont's aides dashed up to me with an order for me to fall back with my whole brigade a mile to the position first occupied by me in the morning. I was never so astonished or thunderstruck in my life. I could not believe what the man said and made him repeat it three times. The balls were whizzing around him like bees, and he was dodging his head down behind his horse like a duck dodging thunder while he was repeating the order, and as soon as he got through, he dashed off at breakneck speed. I was standing close behind the center of my brigade, but felt ashamed to order them to cease firing and file to the rear. I called my aides to me and told them to order the regiments to do so, being careful to carry back all their dead and wounded, which they did with as much coolness as on a parade, all mad and cursing the order to retreat. Brigadier General Robert H. Milroy, Brigade Commander, Fremont's Command. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 154 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all, thanks for tuning into the podcast. Last time we talked about Carroll's raid on Port Republic on the morning of Sunday, June 8, 1862, which caused a surprising amount of mayhem in a short span of time. 
As you all recall, Carroll actually captured the crucially important bridge over the North River, but he was unable to hold it, as Stonewall Jackson improvised on the fly and put together a counterattack that drove the Yankees out of Port Republic. Carroll's uh, foray is generally referred to as a raid, but that hadn't been the intention behind the attack. Although Shields had issued conflicting instructions to Carroll regarding the vital North River Bridge, the last order that Carroll received had directed him to capture the bridge and hold it against all comers. But Carroll had struck too soon, with just a handful of cavalry and a few pieces of artillery, with a worn-out regiment of infantry coming up in support. Had he waited until the rest of his brigade of infantry was on hand, there was a good chance the bridge could have been held, or at least contested, especially since another of Shields' brigades, the one led by Colonel Erastus B. Tyler, was marching toward Port Republic on that Sunday morning to support Carroll. But Carroll pulled the trigger too soon, so to speak, and attacked Port Republic with only that very small force of horsemen and four guns, and was forced to withdraw from the town in short order. As he retreated, the rest of his infantry came up, but they were caught up in the exodus, and the withdrawal quickly became a disorderly pell-mell retreat. Colonel Philip Dom, Shields' chief of artillery, arrived on the scene and helped organize a more orderly withdrawal beyond range of the rebel cannon, which, from the far side of the south fork of the Shenandoah River, had been shadowing Carroll's fleeing men and keeping them under fire. But then Tyler's brigade appeared at about 2.30 that afternoon, and the Confederates ceased any further harassment of the Yankee retreat. In the early evening, Carroll and Tyler held a council of war with their regimental commanders and Colonel Dom to decide what to do in Shields' absence and lacking any communication with Fremont. Tyler was the senior officer present, but he seemed uncertain what to do. Carroll pushed for an immediate retreat, especially since a message had arrived from Shields saying, sorry, but he was still 40 miles away and he and the rest of the division wouldn't be coming to their support any time soon. Dom, however, insisted that Carroll and Tyler's two brigades remain where they were and fight the Confederates if they crossed the river. In the end, Tyler decided to stay, and so the eight Federal regiments and three batteries of his and Carroll's brigades settled in about two miles northeast of Port Republic to wait and see what Monday morning might bring. But more had happened on Sunday than just Carroll's dramatic but unsuccessful attack on Port Republic. As we mentioned last time, while Stonewall Jackson was dealing with that surprise Yankee incursion, a major fight had developed on June 8th on Ewell's front as Fremont advanced from Harrisonburg and grappled with the Confederate force posted northwest to Port Republic there at Cross Keys. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. 
My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. It's uncertain how many Federals actually made the march from Harrisonburg to Cross Keys on Sunday morning. Fremont himself reported his strength at 10,500, but Milroy thought the number closer to 12,000. But even accepting Fremont's lower estimate, he certainly had enough men for the work at hand, since Yule had fewer than 5,000 troops at Cross Keys. At any rate, at a quarter to five on Sunday morning, Fremont's lead element started off from Harrisonburg. This was the tiny brigade of Cluseret, consisting of just the 60th Ohio and 8th West Virginia. Next came Stahel's 1st Brigade of Blanker's Division, then Milroy, followed by Boland's 3rd Brigade and Shank's Brigade. Blanker's 2nd Brigade, commanded by Coltis, brought up the rear. Fremont was convinced he was about to attack Stonewall Jackson's entire force, which he believed to be 16,000 or 18,000 strong. Despite believing he was outnumbered by the Confederates in front of him, Fremont was moving forward, sustained by rumors that Shields had arrived on the opposite side of Port Republic and was about to attack Jackson from behind. The first contact came between 8 and 8.30 that morning, when Cluseret skirmishers encountered two companies of pickets from the 15th Alabama, just north of the Union Church Cemetery. This alerted Yule to the Yankees' approach and provided him with ample time to position his brigades in line of battle. George H. Stewart's brigade anchored the Confederate left, Arnold Elsie's brigade and four batteries of artillery occupied the center of Yule's line, and Isaac Trimble was posted on the right. Although the position, on slightly elevated ground, seemed strong to Yule, with woods on three sides and a large field in front, Trimble felt uneasy about the position of his brigade on the right flank. Trimble worried that the heavy woods would hinder his defense of that sector, and he was also concerned that his position was bent back from the main Confederate line and was, as he put it, quote, somewhat retired from the front, end quote. So Yule gave Trimble permission to move his command forward across the farm of the Widow Pence, and there, now in advance of the main rebel line, Trimble posted his men on a rise behind a split-rail fence. By about 10 a.m., Yule had completed the formation of his line. On the other side of the field, as the Federal Brigades came up, Fremont made one token reconnaissance and then retired to the rear, leaving the disposition of his forces to his chief of staff, Colonel Albert, and his chief of artillery, Colonel Pilsen. By his own admission, Fremont felt nearly helpless. He later said, quote, the enemy occupied a position of uncommon strength, commanding the junction of the roads to Port Republic. He had chosen his ground with great skill and was advantageously posted upon a ridge, protected in front by a steep ascent, and almost entirely masked by thick woods and covered fences. End quote. Despite the fact he, in reality, outnumbered Yule's troops by at least two to one, Fremont had approached Cross Keys believing he was outnumbered by the Confederates to his front. And once he was actually in contact with the enemy, nothing was going to change his mind. He later reported, quote, From superiority of numbers, his flanks considerably overlapped my own. I was without reliable maps or guides, but from what could be seen, I judged that the enemy's right was his strategic flank. I decided, therefore, to press him from this side, with the object to seize, if possible, his line of retreat, and accordingly gave all the strength practicable to my left. End quote. Fremont noticeably didn't say how he proposed to outflank an enemy line that considerably overlapped his own, a line occupied by a foe that, in Fremont's mind, outnumbered his own force considerably. 
As the Federal troops filed into position, Ewell's artillery, grouped in the center of the Confederate line, opened up on the Yankees. As the rebel shells rained down, for some in Fremont's command, the accuracy of the enemy guns was both appalling and astonishing. A reporter for a New York newspaper attached to Fremont's army noted that, quote, the diabolical precision with which shot and shell were instantly pitched at us exceeded anything I had before imagined. It was as though a platoon of backwoodsmen were firing at us with squirrel rifles, that is, so far as the accuracy of aim and not the size of projectile is concerned. End quote. As Fremont's brigades got into position, Pilsen posted eight batteries of guns and answered Ewell's barrage. By 10.30, an artillery duel was raging, although Robert Milroy, who you guys will remember from the Battle of McDowell, Milroy noticed that his three batteries posted near the Armantrout house didn't really seem to be doing much damage to the enemy. Milroy had become increasingly frustrated with Fremont's lack of aggressiveness throughout much of the campaign, and now he took it upon himself to move his guns closer to the Confederate line. While Milroy took matters into his own hands against the left half of the rebel line, Fremont launched his attack against Ewell's right. As we mentioned just a moment ago, Fremont believed this was the enemy's strategic flank, although there was nothing to actually indicate this. At any rate, Fremont launched his initial assault with Stahel's brigade, but among Stahel's five regiments, only two actually attacked Trimble's rebels. With one regiment left behind as battery support and two others having veered off course, only the 8th and 45th New York moved forward toward the Confederate position. The 45th, however, halted its advance short of the enemy line, so that left the 548 men of the 8th New York to assault Trimble's position alone. Trimble's force, 1,400 men from the 21st Virginia, 16th Mississippi, and 15th Alabama, waited until the Yankees were only 50 yards away, and then they opened fire. Trimble later reported, quote, A deadly fire was delivered along our whole front dropping the deluded victims of northern fanaticism and misrule by the score, end quote. The sudden storm of deadly fire stunned the New Yorkers, and they stopped them in their tracks. Within moments, 43 men were killed and 134 wounded. The survivors retreated in confusion, and another 40 or so men were captured as Trimble's men ran forward in pursuit of their devastated foe. After the destruction of the 8th New York, Trimble quickly recalled his men, but then, impatient to renew the contest, he decided to attack a lone Federal battery a half mile away. Trimble personally guided the 15th Alabama into position to take the enemy guns in the flank, while the 16th Mississippi and 21st Georgia advanced directly against the Federals. As Trimble's men moved forward, they were supported by two Virginia regiments, the 13th and 25th, from Elsie's Brigade. The quote I read at the top of the episode from Sergeant Buck of the 13th Virginia described his regiment's advance here at this point in the battle in support of Trimble's attack. As the Confederates advanced, they were taken under fire by the Federal guns, which retreated after a few rounds. And then the rebels came up against Bolin's brigade, which soon withdrew also. Trimble's advance and the resulting relentless pressure on the Union left unnerved Fremont, who, from his position in the rear, was unsure what was happening to the front, and he ordered a withdrawal of his entire line. Fremont's aides rode out to the various Federal brigade commanders to deliver the general's order, and, as you could tell from the quote I read at the top of the post, Robert Milroy was none too happy when he received the word to withdraw. Milroy, for some time, had been working his brigade forward through some rough terrain toward the part of the Confederate line defended by Stuart and Elsie, and at the moment when he sent the 25th Ohio on a maneuver against the rebel left flank, Fremont's courier arrived with the order to retreat. Although his temper flared at the unexpected order, Milroy reluctantly ordered his brigade to pull back. Just as a footnote, but as his men withdrew, Milroy sought out his beloved horse Jasper, who he thought was dead. But to his surprise, Milroy discovered that Jasper was wounded badly, but still alive. 
he guided the injured horse to the rear on its three good legs. Milroy eventually sent Jasper home to the care of his wife in Indiana. As Milroy was pulling his regiments back, though, he saw a sight that made his blood boil. He later wrote, quote, A short distance to the right was Shank's brigade, standing perfectly idle as spectators. Thus five regiments composing the finest brigade in our army had taken no portion in the battle. Had this brigade been thrown forward on my right, we could have swept the battlefield like a tempest. After seeing to Jasper, an angry Milroy sought out Fremont. He wanted an explanation as to why Fremont had ordered the withdrawal. In a letter to his wife, Milroy wrote that Fremont pleaded ignorance of Milroy's potential success against the Confederate left. Milroy, though, complained to his wife that Fremont, quote, had a whole cloud of aides, and it was his duty to know everything that was going on with his army when in battle, end quote. At any rate, Milroy certainly believed that a hesitant and uncertain Fremont had thrown away a golden opportunity at Cross Keys, and he wasn't alone in that assessment. The lack of a guiding hand at the Federal Front was apparent from the start, and Fremont's lack of leadership and aggressiveness plainly exhibited at Cross Keys caused tremendous anger and frustration amongst those officers like Milroy who thought Fremont had thrown away an excellent chance to strike the enemy a telling blow. The firing at Cross Keys ceased at about a quarter after six that evening. As darkness settled over the field, both armies counted the battle's cost. The Federals suffered nearly 700 casualties, while Ewell lost slightly fewer than 300 men. In the Confederate lines that night, Trimble looked across the way at the flickering campfires of the Yankees and believed that he had an opportunity to completely unhinge the enemy's position by launching a surprise night attack. Trimble sought Yule's permission for the attack, but he couldn't find his superior, and he was told that Yule had gone to Port Republic to consult with Stonewall Jackson. Even after Yule returned to Cross Keys, however, Trimble couldn't get permission for his night attack. Although Trimble was frustrated by this, Yule had denied his feisty subordinate's request because he was concerned it might interfere with Stonewall Jackson's overall plan for the following day. You see, Yule knew from his just-concluded meeting with Jackson that Stonewall wanted to concentrate his army at Port Republic and strike at the Federals across the river first thing on Monday morning. But Stonewall wouldn't stop there, because if Confederate success could be achieved quickly in that engagement, then Jackson would rapidly turn his entire army around and have a go at defeating Fremont also. But needless to say, everything would have to go like clockwork for the rebels to accomplish all of that on Monday, and so Yule denied Trimble's request to launch a night attack because Yule knew that even a partial setback during such an assault might throw a wrench into Stonewall's plans for the next day. In anticipation of another charge, I had our remaining supply of canister placed on the ground near the muzzles of the pieces, ready for instant use, and searched the woods in our front with shrapnel. My attention had been called to a fresh battery the enemy were establishing at some distance to our right, and I was watching it through a glass, when from the woods on our left rushed forth the tigers, taking the line in reverse and swarming among Clark's guns. His cannoneers made a stout but short resistance, as pistols and sponge staffs do not count for much against muskets and bayonets. His guns were taken, so was the howitzer, and if ours were to be saved, they must instantly be withdrawn. The right piece was limbered to the rear and started. As the team of the next came up, two of the drivers fell, badly wounded from their saddles. The remaining driver could not control the frightened animals. They broke away and dashed off with the limber, and the piece was abandoned. The gun in the road was in imminent peril. Hastening there, I told the chief of that piece, a splendid soldier, to get up his team and limber to the rear. Cool as if on parade, the sergeant turned to obey when he fell almost at my feet, shot through the heart, and died without uttering a sound. I ran myself to get the team up. It was under cover, and the drivers were loath to leave it. 
By that time a force had broken out of the woods in our front, and yelling like demons came pouring up the road, straight for the remaining gun. Number one, the loader, stood firmly at his post, but number two, who inserts the charge, went down, just as he put a cartridge in the gun. Number one picked up two of our big canisters and rammed them down. The man whose duty it was to fire actually got the primer in the vent when his heart failed him and he dropped the lanyard and ran. The gunner who stood by the trail ready to help limber seized it and fired. This opened a lane and checked the onset of that particular lot of tigers for an instant, in which we limbered up the piece, the cannoneers jumped on, and the drivers lost no time in getting away with it to the rear. The gun saved, I felt rather at a loss as to what course to adopt. My first impulse was to lie down and surrender, as there seemed to be a very poor prospect of reaching cover with a whole skin. But having a wholesome dread of southern hospitality, as dispensed at that period, I concluded to take the chances, and was lucky enough to slip out between the bullets. Captain James F. Huntington, Battery H, 1st Ohio Light Artillery, Tyler's Brigade After crossing the river, we were soon in range of a battery stationed two miles below the town and shelling our advance. Our regiment was ordered to the right of the line so as to flank the enemy's battery referred to, and to accomplish this we had to march up the side of the mountain. Owing to our guide having lost the way, we were much delayed. Our duty was to flank the enemy while Taylor's brigade charged the battery, which was playing with terrible effect upon our troops in front of it. Owing to this delay, we did not get into position until Taylor was making his second charge and succeeded in capturing, but not holding it. So Major Wheat of the Louisiana Tigers cut horses' throats or shot them so as to keep the enemy from carrying guns off before we could make another attack. This saved the guns for us. An effort was made to move the pieces, but want of horses prevented it. We came in sight and on flank just as Taylor made his second and successful charge. It was a sickening sight. Men in gray and those in blue piled up in front of and around the guns, and with horses dying and the blood of men and beasts flowing almost in a stream. Major Wheat was as bloody as a butcher, having cut some of the horses' throats with his knife. Sergeant Samuel D. Buck, 13th Virginia, Elsie's Brigade. During the early morning hours of June 9th, Ewell's men marched to Port Republic to carry out Jackson's plan to divide and conquer the Federals. As Ewell marched away from Cross Keys, a portion of his command, including Trimble's brigade, was left behind as a rear guard to keep a close eye on Fremont and, if hard-pressed, retire across the North River and burn the covered bridge behind them. While most of Ewell's men marched away from Cross Keys, Stonewall Jackson put his plan into action. At about 5 a.m., the Stonewall Brigade, led by Charles Winder, left its camps above the North River, marched into Port Republic using the covered bridge, then crossed the South River on a rickety makeshift span that had been hastily constructed using a half a dozen wagons and loose boards obtained from a nearby sawmill. Once across the South River, Winder marched his men northeast to strike the Union line, which ran parallel with Lewiston Lane. Although the ground in front of Lewiston Lane was open and presented good fields of fire for the Federals, the position took its strength from its flanks. The South Fork of the Shenandoah guarded the Union right, while at the other end of the line, a commanding 70-foot-high elevation known as the Coaling anchored the Union left. 4,000 Federals of Carroll's and Tyler's brigades manned the line, but the key to the position was the Coaling, which got its name from the fact that the Lewis family, whose home sat at the hill's base, used the height to chop down the trees there and burn them to make charcoal for their blacksmith shops. Much of the hill was covered with scrub oak and thick underbrush, but the open areas on top of the coaling and any Federal artillery posted there would command the entire field of battle. Realizing the value of the coaling, the Yankees posted a 12-pounder howitzer and six 10-pounder Parrot rifles there. 
A heavy fog obscured the landscape until 5.45, and Winder used the cover to deploy his regiments. He first sent the 5th and 27th Virginia to attack the Federal right. Before Winder launched his infantry assault, he intended to soften up the Yankee flank with Captain Pogue's artillery. Pogue's guns quickly drew counter-battery fire from the Federal cannon, and for at least an hour, by some accounts, the guns of both sides engaged in an artillery duel. During this time, the fog lifted to reveal a clear sky above the battlefield. It soon became clear that the Union artillery held the advantage at Port Republic. Stonewall Jackson later admitted that, quote, "...the artillery fire was well sustained by our batteries." but found unequal to that of the enemy, end quote. During the artillery duel, Winder hoped that Pogue's guns would not only weaken the line prior to the infantry assault Winder was going to send forward, but he also hoped the artillery duel would allow time for reinforcements to arrive on the scene. But Jackson was having a difficult time getting support across the South River to Winder, After the passage of the Stonewall Brigade through Port Republic, the town's streets quickly became clogged with troops and wagons, and chaos reigned as the rickety makeshift bridge across the South River became a bottleneck that slowed movement to a crawl. Only one regiment, the 7th Louisiana, could initially be sent to Winder's aid. Time concerned Jackson at this point. Before the battle began, Stonewall hoped that he would be able to crush the Federals at Port Republic by 10 a.m. and then turn back to strike at Fremont. If Jackson had any hope of dealing with both Yankee forces, though, Winder needed to attack without delay and without proper support. And so once again, Stonewall, as he had done already during the campaign, committed his forces to a battle piecemeal. Here at Port Republic, as Tolliver would put it, quote, The impetuosity of Jackson betrayed him into attacking before his troops were sufficiently massed, which was made difficult by the insufficient means of crossing the river. With the 5th Virginia on the left, the 7th Louisiana in the center, and the 27th Virginia on the right, the Confederates moved across the open ground toward Lewiston Lane. As the advancing rebels drove back the blue clad skirmishers, the Union officers readied their men to receive the enemy assault. Tyler had positioned five guns on his right, a few hundred yards shy of the South Fork, with the 7th Indiana in line of battle between the cannon and the riverbank. To the left of the artillery pieces was the 29th Ohio, then the 5th Ohio, and then the Union, 1st Virginia, with its left flank resting near the Lewis House. To protect the all-important coaling, Tyler placed the 66th Ohio directly to the rear of the artillery deployed there and held the 84th and 110th Pennsylvania in reserve up in the woods behind the position. On Monday morning, Carroll had tried once again to get Tyler to withdraw, but Tyler had once again turned down the idea and had instead readied the Federal force for battle. Now, as the Confederates advanced toward Lewiston Lane, the commander of the 29th Ohio, Colonel Lewis Buckley, ordered his men to, quote, aim low, and at every shot let a traitor fall, end quote. A Union soldier in the 29th recalled how, quote, when in close range the rebels charged, reserving our fire until they were almost upon us, the order was given, and with the yell the entire line poured its leaden hail into the gray-clad columns, producing fearful slaughter, end quote. With Confederate reinforcements slow and coming up due to the bottleneck in Port Republic, there wasn't enough rebel strength present on the battlefield at this time to break the Union right. Despite Winder's best efforts, the Southerners were stopped by the overwhelming Union fire, and then the rebel soldiers fell back. As the Confederates gave ground, Union troops from Carroll's brigade rushed forward after the retreating enemy. A member of Stonewall Jackson's staff later recalled, quote, The Federalists now advanced from their cover with loud and taunting cheers, pierced the center of our feeble line, and threatened to throw the fugitives against the river. As the Federals charged, Pogue's gunners moved to limber their guns, but so many of the battery's horses had been killed that only one piece could be removed from the field. 
As a result, Polk ordered his other gunners to fire as long as possible and then abandon their position and flee. One of the men, Robert Barton, remembered that, quote, We could almost tell the colors of the eyes of the enemy before we were ordered to cease firing and fall back. Fortunately for the rebels, two more Virginia regiments, the 44th and 58th Virginia, now arrived to support Winder's shattered force. The southern reinforcements put enough starch back into the Confederate line that the charging Federals were stopped, and then, their headlong advance having been halted, the blue-clad soldiers returned to their original position back along Lewiston Lane. Although the situation on that sector of the battlefield was now stabilized, it had nevertheless been a near-run thing, and Stonewall Jackson fully realized that the key to Confederate success lay not there, on the open fields in front of Lewiston Lane, but the key to Confederate success lay on the Union left flank, up on the coaling. With Winder's assault on the Union right having ended in failure, Stonewall Jackson now focused his efforts on the enemy's left flank and the guns positioned atop the coaling. Jackson must also have realized by this time that he certainly wouldn't meet his goal of driving off Carroll and Tyler by 10 a.m., and so he must have known it would now be impossible for him to also deal with Fremont that day. The initial Confederate assault against the coaling proved that it would be no easy task to drive the enemy guns from their commanding position atop that elevation. During the opening rebel movements, we mentioned that Winder had divided his command. With part of his force, he had advanced against the Federals holding Lewiston Lane, but Winder had sent the other half of his command against the coaling. The 2nd and 4th Virginia, along with a two-gun section of artillery, moved against the coaling, but the enemy guns, from their commanding position 70 feet above the battlefield, destroyed the rebel advance and sent the Confederates reeling backward in disarray. Some of the Union infantry supporting the artillery added their fire to the defense, and one of the southern officers noted that the Virginia troops, who initially attempted to attack the coaling, were, quote, subjected to heavy fire of musketry and canister, thrown into confusion, and forced to retire, end quote. With the initial assault on the coaling having failed, Jackson turned to Taylor's Louisiana Brigade to win the day for him. Taylor's men had broken the Union line at Winchester, and now Stonewall expected the Louisianans to do the same thing here at Port Republic. Taylor led his command, consisting of the 8th and 9th Louisiana and Wheat's battalion, up into the thickets and dense underbrush to the right of the coaling, while the 2nd Virginia and 4th Virginia attempted to reorganize following their repulse. The eager Louisianans struggled upward through the rough terrain toward the sound of the Union guns. Finally reaching the top of the coaling, Taylor's men boiled out of the woods and underbrush, stumbled down into a ravine up the other side, and then pitched straight into the Yankees. As the Louisianans let out the rebel yell and charged, the 66th Ohio, supporting the Union guns, fired a volley at the Southerners, but the mass of the Confederates swarmed over the left side of the Yankee gun line. As soon as Erastus Tyler became aware of the danger to the coaling, he directed a few of the Union guns down on Lewiston Lane to hurry over and blast the ranks of the Louisianans. And as the 66th Ohio readied itself for a counterattack, the 5th and 7th Ohio left the Union right flank to hustle over to the coaling. Also ready to enter the fray, at the endangered spot were the 84th and 110th Pennsylvania, both of which passed the morning shuttling between the right wing and left wing without firing a shot. As the Federals neared the recently overrun portion of their gun line, the Louisianans started to kill the battery horses to prevent the counterattacking Yankees from taking away the cannon. All over the coaling, horses fell, shrieking and jerking in their death throes. Major Wheat drew out his knife and joined in the slaughter. Captain Eugene Powell of the 66th Ohio said, The sight of the captured battery was fearful beyond description. Our gunners were mostly killed at their guns, while the horses had been shot or bayoneted while in their harness. 
After perhaps 15 minutes of vicious, bloody, close-quarters combat, the Ohioans succeeded in driving Taylor's men back into and beyond the ravine. When the Yankees tried to haul off the freshly retaken guns by hand, Louisiana riflemen cut them down, and only one piece was removed before Taylor renewed the rebel attack. It was now about 10 o'clock, and across the river, Fremont was just putting his men in motion. Shank's brigade, having barely participated in the action there at Cross Keys the day before, led the way, expecting to fight Ewell again on the same battlefield. But the only thing Shank's men found in front of them were the dead and dying from the previous day's fighting. Ewell was already gone. By the time Fremont realized the rebels were gone from Cross Keys, Ewell's brigades were through the bottleneck at Port Republic and across the South River and were racing toward Monday's battlefield. Ewell, with the idea of also striking the Yankees' left, was approaching the woods at the same spot where Taylor had gone in when he spotted the 5th and 7th Ohio pulling out of the Lewiston Lane line to go and join the fight for the coaling. Without wasting a moment, Yule brought his troops in on the flank of the Ohioans and poured in a staggering volley. The 5th and 7th Ohio were taken completely by surprise and fell back in confusion. Meanwhile, Taylor had thrown his Louisianans forward in a second attack on the culling, but after another round of fierce close-quarters combat, the rebels were once again thrown back. Mounting casualties, however, and the irresistible impulse of Taylor's third attack meant that the beleaguered Federals atop the coaling were finally forced to retreat and give up the much-fought-over spot. By that time, the coaling was a scene of concentrated carnage. A member of Jackson's staff was dumbstruck to see how many of the brave Union artillerymen had died defending their pieces. After the war, Richard Taylor summed up the spectacle with the words, quote, I have never seen so many dead and wounded in the same limited space. By that point, remnants of the 2nd and 4th Virginia were coming up in support of the Louisianans, and Ewell had directed his men from their successful attack on the Ohio regiments, and they too were bearing down on the embattled Union left. Meanwhile, Winder had seen the Federal units being pulled out of the Lewiston Lane line and being redirected to the coaling, so he seized the opportunity to press forward with the 27th Virginia. And within minutes, the Union battle line collapsed, and the Yankees were fleeing the field, and Stonewall Jackson ordered his entire command forward in pursuit of the retreating enemy. The Confederates would keep up the chase for about eight miles. Before exhausted, they ended the pursuit and returned to Port Republic. By about 11 a.m., Jackson had secured victory at the Battle of Port Republic. As the Yankees abandoned their positions and fled, Fremont's brigades finally arrived on the scene, over on the bluffs on the other side of the South Fork of the Shenandoah. Ewell's rear guard had burned the North Fork Bridge, and so, unable to offer any real support to Carroll and Tyler's retreating men, a frustrated Fremont nevertheless ordered his batteries to unlimber on the north side of the river and fire on the battlefield a half a mile away. All this useless act by Fremont accomplished was to drive off the Confederate ambulances that had come onto the field to help the wounded. Alabama and William Oates said, quote, His rage was so great that his artillery was turned upon our ambulances and parties engaged in the humane labors of attending to the dead and wounded of both sides. End quote. Stonewall had secured a victory, but his poor tactical management of another battle, seen here in the rushed piecemeal deployment of his troops, meant it had taken him four hours and cost him 816 casualties to dislodge a force a third his number. Union losses were higher due to the large number of captured, and the most reliable figure is that just over a thousand Federals were killed, wounded, or missing at the Battle of Port Republic. Given the butcher's bill for the fighting on June 9th, it's distressing to realize that Port Republic was arguably a battle that need never have been fought. Stonewall Jackson could just as easily have burned the North River Bridge and taken his army off to the nearby mountains and Brown's Gap without a costly fight at Port Republic. And as for the Federals, there was no reason for Tyler to have sacrificed his and Carroll's brigades making a stand at Port Republic. 
On Monday, June 9th, James Shields had advanced less than 10 miles toward Port Republic with the two brigades under his personal command when, quote, a crowd of fugitives from the field gave evidence of a retreat, end quote. And so Shields rallied the shattered remnants of Tyler's and Carroll's brigades as they streamed up the road, and then he was in the process of notifying Fremont of his intent to continue his advance the next day when he received a message from Irvin McDowell. It read, quote, It being the intention of the President that the troops of this department be employed elsewhere, the Major General Commanding directs that you cease all further pursuit and bring back your division to Luray and get ready for a march to Fredericksburg. End quote. A similar message went to Fremont, and so the Valley Campaign had come to an end. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is Richard S. Yule, A Soldier's Life by Donald C. Fans. We've mentioned Yule quite a bit here with regard to the Valley Campaign, and for those of you who might want to know more about Richard Stoddart Yule, uh, this biography by Fans is the place to go. Uh, Tracy and I happen to think Yule is one of the more interesting characters in a war that was full of interesting characters, so we highly recommend this book if you want to dig a bit deeper into his life story. So that's Richard S. Yule, A Soldier's Life by Donald C. Fans, and you can find it and all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. And then just yesterday, we released the 34th members episode for all of you who have enlisted in the ranks of the Strawfoot Brigade, and we do have some new members to welcome this time, Judy and Earl and Greg and Katrina. Uh, good to have you ladies and gentlemen on board. And then we want to thank Darren R. in Israel for his donation and very nice note that went along with it. Thanks, Darren. And then just to give you guys an idea of where we're headed now that we're winding down the Valley Campaign, well, next week we'll look at what happened in the immediate aftermath of the battles of Cross Keys and Port Republic with Stonewall Jackson and Ewell and their men heading east to join Robert E. Lee in the defense of Richmond. And we'll also offer a final um, summation of the Valley Campaign and a an assessment of just what Jackson accomplished during it. Uh, and as part of that episode, we'll also be sure to tie in what was happening on the peninsula as the Valley Campaign unfolded, since we're about to head back to the peninsula to cover the very dramatic events associated with the Seven Days Battles. So lots of good stuff to look forward to. But thanks for listening to this episode of the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope you'll join us again next week as we wrap up our coverage of the Valley Campaign and turn our attention back to the peninsula. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>